So I'm going to talk about, uh, um, eventually, talk about the action on quad decrease. But today, uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, on real hyperbolic space, which is uh, one of the important uh, subjects in the degree theory. I, I, I can see many, many young people in the room, so I, I had a so um, let me start with the uh, hyperbolic plane. Uh, okay. So this is a hyperbolic plane, and if you draw a geodesic triangle, Like this. So we have a hyperbolic plane and we have a triangle whose three sides are all geodesics. Then, um, well, alpha, beta, gamma. Then, and I also write the angle ABC then by, by Gauss Bonnet. Uh, okay, so this is, this is a triangle delta. And the area in delta plus uh, a plus b plus c is pi. This is what Gauss Bonnet tells you. And so from this, from this, you 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 possibly you notice that there's a sum of the angles are uh, 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 are less than pi, which is different from the Euclidean plane, but also the area is, is less than pi as well, which is, again, very different from the Euclidean space because in the Euclidean plane, if you draw a big triangle, the area can be as big as you want. Okay. And also, um, because of this upper bound, uniform upper bound on the area, if I draw in, inscribe the circle here, like this. And I have a, of course, uh, the area of this ball is at most pi as well because uh, it, it's a subset. But also, um, well, because of that, I have an upper bound on the radius as well. Uh, the, the easy upper bound is, is 1. So you have a radius, and R is at most 1. Well, it's because, so the area of this, this, this ball is at most pi. And imagine you are in hyperbolic, sorry, Euclidean plane, then if the, the area of the ball is at most pi, then the, the radius is at the most one, right? Because this radius is one, then the area is exactly pi. And it turns out there is, there's many ways to show that uh, in hyperbolic plane, uh, you have a ball of the same same area as a type of, uh, so Euclidean plane, then the radius gets smaller. So that's why you get this upper bound. Actually, you can do better than one, but uh, one is one is uh, one is good enough for of us. Then you notice that um, so this is at most one, and this is at most one. Therefore, uh, it follows that this side alpha is in the two neighborhood. The union of beta and gamma. Okay. The reason is that uh, okay. So, so this part is in the two neighborhood of this part because this one and one. And I'm secretly using the convexity of the distance function. So I, I'm secretly using that the distance between this part and this part is is biggest than here. But is that distance is the most two. And then this part is a two neighborhood of this part of B, beta. Therefore, alpha is always two, neighbor, uh, two neighborhood of beta and, and gamma, okay? And this was uh, any geodesic triangle on a hyperbolic, hyperbolic plane 
and then each side is contained in the two neighborhood of the union of the other two. Okay. So this one, Gromov says that, that uh, this triangle is too thin. So if you have a triangle, the one side is contained in, say, two neighborhood or the other two, then Gromov says that the triangle is too thin. And of course, so the point is, in a hyperbolic plane, any geodesic triangle is too thin. This is what you, you see in this picture. So here's the definition. Following this picture, this is due to Gromov, so delta and holistic. So you have a geodesic space, means it's a metric space. The distance between two points is realized by some path, the length of some path, uh, which is called geodesic. Then you call it geodesic space. Um, if there exists a constant delta such that any geodesic triangle, say alpha, beta, gamma, um, alpha is contained in delta neighborhood. In, in that case, it was two. But the union of the other two, uh, then. Uh, this space X is called delta of all. Okay. And this property is called delta thin of this triangle. So, um, so as, I, I, as I wrote, hyperbolic plane is too thin. So example, hyperbolic plane is, oh, okay, too, any triangle is too thin, therefore it's too hyperbolic. Only. But also, uh, any dimensional hyperbolic space, well, this is about uh, three points. Therefore, for any given three points, you can always find uh, embedded isometrically, uh, embedded hyperbolic, hyperbolic plane in the hyperbolic space. Therefore, this is also the hyperbolic. Uh, the other, another very extreme example is, is a tree. Uh, which is by definition, well, in this talk, uh, it's a uh, it's, uh, simply connected and connected graph and no empty. Uh, it, it, by definition, it's a tree, and so it's like. And canonically, this becomes a, a geodesic space because uh, we can really measure the distance. If you if you assign, say, one, the length one to each edge, so this is a geodesic space, is a, in fact, so, zero hyperbolic. Okay, let, let's, let's see that. So uh, if you draw, and in Jewish triangle, to say, to suppose those three are the vertices, then actually there is a unique Jewish triangle having those three points as the a, as a vertices. So one side is this, this is alpha, and this is beta, and this is gamma. Okay. So, for uh, example, alpha is contained in, in, in the union of beta and gamma. So it's contained in the zero neighborhood of the union of beta and gamma. That means it's you know, zero hyperbolic. Um, what is important is the existence of, the, of this constant delta. So, and exact value is not always very important. Therefore, I may sometimes just say this, this space x is hyperbolic if such constant delta exists. 
Okay. Um, and one example is, so this is, this is a, those three are examples. And one example is have Euclidean plane. So when I, I write it this way, it's not just a topological plane, but there is a metric. It's really Euclidean plane. Is uh, not and hyperbolic for any 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 constant delta. It's just because on Euclidean plane you can you can go triangle like this as big as you want, then this there is no upper bound on the on this delta really. So this is not an hyperbolic. This looks like a very naive definition, but turns out to be that you can prove many things. So, um, let me let me state an even proof. A very, very basic lemma. So, one, this is always one. If so suppose x is the hyperbolic. And if alpha and beta are geodesic in this data, I will take x from the common two point P to Q. So the picture is like this is P, and this is Q, and this is alpha, and this is beta. In, in the case of a tree, if you, if you give two points, say P and Q here, then uh, there's a unique, unique geodesic from P, P to Q. But in general, in hyperbolic space, you, have, you don't have this uniqueness of geodesics between two points. But if you have two geodesics, alpha and beta, between P and Q, then um, well, I write this half of half of distance between alpha and beta in the most uh, Delta. So this is the house of distance, namely uh, alpha is containing delta labeled beta and beta and beta is containing delta labeled alpha. Okay. This is this is obvious. For example, if you like really like to see from the definition, maybe you just put another so the vertex here, and you see this bicon of the triangle, then now alpha is two edges, alpha one and alpha two, then uh, exactly by the delta singles, the definition of the probability, beta is containing the union of alpha and alpha two, which is alpha. Therefore, beta is containing delta negative alpha, and vice versa. So this is trivial, and the second claim is less trivial, and if alpha and beta are by infinite geodesic, namely uh, this is geodesics, but uh, it continues to the both sides uh, forever, such that house of distance between alpha and beta is finite, well, then the means that there exists some constant L, which is finite number, such that alpha is in the L level of the beta, and beta is L level of the alpha, then, in fact, uh, this distance is most trivial. So what about the boundaries? Well, you always have the same bound to delta. Okay, let's prove this. Well, I just, before I prove, I, I just say, in, in this case, so we say, alpha is parallel to beta and write alpha to the beta. 
just a notation. Okay, so let me prove this. Um, you have alpha, and you have beta. So, and you just know that the, there is a bound between distance between alpha, half of distance between alpha and beta, namely for any, any okay, all right. <coughs> but I'm going to claim that in fact they are very close to each other at most uh, distance to delta. Secretly, I, I see this constant delta very small. So let me prove it. So I take uh, any point alpha on P, my goal is to uh, you can find uh, some point on beta whose distance from B, P is at most 2 delta. Okay. Um, since alpha is by infinite geodesics, so I take point Q and R, which is very far from P. Okay. So very far from P, a little P. Then, the, because of this assumption, the, for, for Q, there must be a point on beta, Q prime, whose distance is at most L. L is this, this number. And also for R, since the half of distance between L and beta is at most L, so there must be a point on beta whose distance from R is the most L. Okay. And then I go in a geodesic between Q prime and, and R. And I know that, uh, so you see two geodesics, geodesic, two, sorry, two parameters. Each of them is delta hyperbolic. Sorry, delta thin, because I assume actually delta hyperbolic. Um, There, if you look at this upper triangle, this point P has to be in the delta neighborhood of the union of this QQ prime and Q prime R because of delta thinness. But my claim is that, in fact, this point P is in the delta neighborhood of Q prime R on this side, not, not this side. The reason is it is impossible if this distance is at most delta, you know, this distance is at most L, and I, I say Q, Q is much <coughs> very far from P. So this is impossible because of triangle inequality. Okay? Therefore, in fact, you can find a point on this side whose distance from P is at most delta. Okay, this, this say P1. Now I look at this triangle which is delta thin, therefore for this P1, there must be a point on this side, or that side, whose length from P1 is at most delta. However, again, this R is very far from P. So P and P1 is close to each other. Therefore, the point I'm looking for must be on this side. This is so now I find a point P2 whose distance from P is at most 2 delta. But P was any point, so I have proven that uh, alpha is 2 delta neighbor for the beta. Okay, so this is, a, this, is a, this is not a typical argument, but this is a kind of argument you use all the time when you, you, you argue under the hyperbolic space. Okay. Then I'd like to introduce uh, one important definition, another important definition, which is a quasi geodesic. Um, so it's best if you, if you can always talk about geodesics, but uh, when you argue on the hyperbolic geometry, it's better to look at something more flexible, which is quasi geodesics. So, this is the definition of quasi geodesics. So, a path gamma from 
So this is a task. Maybe the domain is say A B or A infinity. It can be anything, but this is just a task. Probably. Is a quasi So they think if there is a constant k and epsilon such that for any parameter t and s, well, I just write it. I just use it r, but if it's in the domain a and b, it must be the point in the interval a and b. If you, so the picture is going to be like this. So this is in x. And you have you have R here, and this is the map. Such uh, for any any T and S, you have points gamma T and gamma S in X, and I I denote the distance between gamma T and gamma S by gamma T minus gamma S. This is the distance. Uh, so for the distance, if this was a geodesic, this is same as k minus s, but this is not exactly geodesic, but a quasi one. Therefore, uh, it's even be less than or worse than by by Lipschitz. What is like this? Okay. So there was no epsilon. What or in other words, if you if epsilon was zero, then it's just saying that this map is by Lipschitz with a constant k, where k is, um, and it's a little bit worse than well, by, by Lipschitz with this additional constant. But, um, so this is a definition which turned out to be very useful. I'm not going to use this very much, but I just wanted to mention this, this concept, uh, which is very important. But the point is that uh, um, if you have a quasi geodesic in the hyperbolic space, it's uh, more or less same as geodesic. That's the point, uh, which is formally stated as the most lemma. Um, Suppose x is a delta hyperbolic space, so any Julius triangle is delta thin, and, and you have constant k and epsilon, which is for this the definition of quasi geodesics. Then there is a constant L, which depends on k and epsilon and delta, such that uh, for any k epsilon quasi geodesics, by the way, so for this, what, so, uh, <coughs> but again, it's same as the hyperbolic space. If constant delta exists, then I just say hyperbolic. But if the constant k and epsilon exists, I just maybe say quasi geodesics. But if I like to specify the constant, I say this is k epsilon quasi geodesics. But of course, this is a, if this is a binary interval, any any pass is k epsilon quasi geodesic for some constant k and epsilon, which only makes sense, make difference if the domain is R. But to to state most lemma in k and epsilon, so for any k k epsilon quasi geodesic. Um, from x to y, the house of distance between gamma and the geodesic from x to y is at most uh, well. So this is the geodesic from x to y. So remember, the geodesic from x to y is not unique. However, because of this lemma, this is more or less unique. So the distance between those two geodesics is a most delta. So the picture is like this. So you have quasi-geodesic x to y, and 
and we draw as a basic as a straight line from x to y, then this the distance is over the most L. So if you have a quasi-geodesics, it's really in this sense a geodesic. I mean, like a geodesic. So because of the, so this is the uh, most lemma, um, which I don't use this in this lecture, I think, but this is very key, key lemma, so I stated it. Okay, so now I would like to talk about uh, group action on the hyperbolic space, in the hyperbolic space. Oh, before I go, by the way, this most lemma is not true on the Euclidean plane. Does not hold is, is not true on the Euclidean plane. Again, the, the example, the counter example is the same as this one. Um, if you have this kind of triangle, then the union of those two is always, say, two, two quantities of this. This is, I think, two zero quasi-geodesic. The picture is in x and y. But the, you can bound the distance between this yellow quasi-geodesic and the basic between x and y by some fixed uh, uniform constant. If I draw a bigger and bigger triangle, then the distance, also distance, gets bigger as much as you like. Therefore, most lemma is not true in hyperbolic, sorry, Euclidean space. So I like to talk about group actions. Again, let me discuss an example. Um, so let's take. Um, Genus 2 surface, close the surface of genus 2, and you can put hyperbolic metric on this. You put it's not unique, but you, you just uh, choose one of them. This hyperbolic means it's really like in your Riemannian geometry. The section of arbitrary constants minus 1. And um, and you have a I one of this surface, and um, I just choose one L and G, uh, which is not real. Let's choose uh, one L and G here. So since this is I one of this space, so uh, this is represented by a loop. That's really very simple. Easy loop. But also, since you have a metric, I, I can choose. I can make it the shortest. So I just type it up. So it's not like this, but then it's going to be like that. So this is a geodesic. But not uh, in the sense I have been using, but it's, uh, it's geodesic in the Riemannian manifold sense. This is a Riemannian geodesic. So locally it's shortest, but globally certainly this is a loop, so this is not really geodesic in the sense I have been using. Uh, representing G. Okay. So now I go to the universal part of this hyperbolic plane. Sorry. Hyperbolic surface, this is universal cover, Riemannian universal cover, which is isomorphic to hyperbolic plane. Then you 
had uh, one leaf of this porous geodesic like this. And since this porous geodesic was uh, representing this element G, I chose in the beginning, uh, I can choose this leaf so that uh, the point is because of the power in theory, this pi 1 and sigma is acting on this hyperbolic plane by isometry. And this hyperbolic surface is a portion by this action. So what I'm saying is that if I choose uh, this polygonistic for G, if I, if I choose a width properly, then this, this gamma tilde is invariant by G and G acts on by translation. And then this 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 geodesic uh, if I let G act on, on this and if I go to the quotient then you really get this uh, more geodesic. So you see so I, I write it by like this. So this is the geodesic. In the sense, I have been using it for any two points, the distance is realized. So, so gamma tilde is a geodesic. In the hyperbolic plane, which is G invariant, and G acts on gamma tilde by a translation. Now uh, let's uh, take this as a definition of uh, a hyperbolic isometry. <coughs> so now x is a delta hyperbolic space, like the hyperbolic plane, and if you have a isometry from x to x. Isometry is hyperbolic if there is gamma. Well, I wish I can say it is geodesic, but I, I can't. So that's why I introduced quasi geodesic. If there is a quasi geodesic, which is G invariant and G acts on gamma by, by a translation. Okay. So you have this quasi geodesic and so G mapped gamma to G gamma and so you like translation so So this is the definition. So in particular Since uh, this is a quasi geodesic, uh, if you take for any point x on quasi geodesic, and if you look at the orbit of this point by the action of g, so gx, g cube x, sorry, g square x and g cube x, the distance from the base point grows linearly with maybe additional constant error. Uh, so in particular, there exists a constant C, any point, uh, yeah, this is an exchangeable. Any point, any over n, so x minus g to the n, x is this the C n. Yeah. Okay. So the, the orbit, the distance to the orbit grows linear. Okay. Just because this gamma was a quasi geodesic. Well, yeah. But uh, actually, the point is the compass is true, which is also interesting. If you have an isometry on the hyperbolic space such that the, the orbit of one point grows linear in this sense, then you can find the uh, invariant quasi geodesics for G. But, um, 
I want to use that either. Okay, uh, so this is the definition of hyperbolic isometry. And, um, and we say this gamma is an axis of G. Okay? So again, for the hyperbolic plane case, this was uh, this gamma tilde was uh, an axis. This was the uh, geodesic. G, but in this case it was also unique. There is no other this which is defined by G. Uh, in the general case, so there, there usually there is always there is more than one one plus geodesic which is invariant by G. But the point is what you can show is that uh, Gamma one and gamma two are axes for G, then gamma one and gamma two are parallel. So which is obvious because uh, so we have gamma one here and gamma two here, and uh, each of them is invariant by G. So just uh, I just choose two points randomly, say uh, well, uh, P1 and P2. Okay, I just join join them by geodesic. It may be helpful. And I just let G out of this segment, so you get G alpha, to G square alpha. The point is well, those distance, the, sorry, those lengths are the same. Therefore. It looks like a ladder forever for both directions. Therefore, the half of distance between gamma one and gamma two is finite. So in this sense, we can we can say that the zero is a unique in this sense uh, axis for hyperbolic isometry for good hyperbolic space. Okay. Um, let's go back to this picture. And I I take another another element A in the pi one, and then A acts on this hyperbolic plane. Therefore, this gamma tilde is mapped to another geodesic like this. Well, if G A happens to be say G or G square, of course, A gamma tilde is same as gamma tilde uh, as a subset, but uh, Typically, it's going to be another geodesic like this. And of course, if, uh, if you if you look at the quotient by the pi, action of pi one, it's going to be this whole geodesic downstairs. And moreover, this geodesic a gamma tilde is an axis for a conjugate of G. So for um, this is a so any A A gamma tilde is a geodesic which is an axis for um three equals okay. Well the reason is okay. Just let's let's just apply a g a, a inverse to a a gamma a, a gamma tilde. Then you get a g gamma tilde, and you get a gamma tilde. So this is invariant by the conjugate a g a inverse, and 
So the action part. And you have to verify that this is a translation, but that it's actually it's really the same picture. So that I don't need to introduce the translation links, but the, the translation from G and A G and the inverse are same. It's really the same picture. But uh, yeah. Okay. Um uh, did you say this one? Oh. This is this is this is linear too, because uh triangle in the code. Yeah. In general. In general. Right? Um, so this is a segment, and this is uh, the image of this segment by G. So just try and link code, right? Yeah, it's always the case that uh, yeah. point is a, is a lower bound. Yeah, the, the, what I said is the point is a lower bar if the, this lower bar is like lower, which can happen. So we have a parabolic isometry for the hyperbolic plane, then this is not hyperbolic in the sense it's a lower, linear lower bound is, is, is the key. And I, I repeat that the converse is true. If you have a no, linear lower bound, then there is an invariant going to this. Okay, so this picture is a little bit too small, but uh, now I like to talk about the projection. So I know the big picture here. So you have you have gamma tilde, you have then a gamma tilde. So now I like to project gamma to a gamma tilde. So this is going to be what my talk is, is about. The projection to, from one to this to another and try to see how they, they match up in, in the global picture. So this is the nearest. OK, again, uh, setting the hyperbolic space, you have a geodesic. Well, Quasi is fine, but let's assume that the uh, avoid the complication is a geodesic. And you have a nearest pro projection from x to gamma. So this is the nearest one to projection. So you have gamma. For any point P, you try to find a point which you allow the distance from P to gamma. Well, this is not unique. Uh, on the hyperbolic plane, the Euclidean plane, this projection is uniquely determined, but on the hyperbolic space, this is not unique. But again, um, in fact, uh, uh, this is uniquely determined with bounded error. The point is, if you have a uh, projection point uh, A and B, which, which differs from each other, then again, you see a triangle here, and if distance between A and B is too large, then the picture is going to look like like this, because the uh, triangle is thin. But this is a contradiction, because A was supposed to be the nearest point from P to the geodesic, but this point is, is much closer to the geodesic. So it's not, not going to be like this. So this the bottom side has to be short. So there is a uniform at the bottom of the nail. So this is uh, not uniquely determined. So nearest points projection with, say, bounded error. Okay. So 
this is the definition of nearest point projection from X to a subset of gamma. So, yeah, a subset of gamma. And um, and here's a key lemma I like to show. Okay, I can have a little hyperbolic um, and I assume a group G is acti acting on X by isometry. So each element is isometry of X and a property. So I, I see the definition of property soon. I, when I finish the statement of the lemma. Uh, and assume that G is the element hyperbolic with, with gamma as an axis. So this is a quasi since you really like this picture. Well, you have tilde here, but uh, in, in that uh, lemma, there is no tilde here. Um, then, there is a constant L such that uh, any element A in G either A gamma is power to gamma in the sense I define namely the half of distance between a gamma and gamma is finite or the projection from a gamma to gamma is bounded in diagonal by L. Okay. So what is the picture here? Um, well, so in this, so we have many orbits of gamma tilde by the group action. So A gamma tilde, B gamma tilde. So the claim is either A gamma tilde, the gamma tilde parallel, but by the way, in this case, in this case, if they are parallel, they exactly coincide. So if they are distinct, then this claim says that uh, if you project A gamma, to gamma, then this, this, this is at most L. But the point is, this is really uniform for any, any other orbit which is different from gamma tilde. Okay. So this is what the lemma claims. So I, I call it bounded projection. So properly, the definition is uh, for any point x, any point, uh, any number r, uh, the set which map x to gx whose distance from x is most r is finite. And this is the definition. So you have x and you have a metric for r. And there are only finally many elements which maps Gx into this ball. Okay, this is the problem. Okay, for example, uh, this, this, this was a proper action. Okay, so uh, let's prove this. So assume the projection is very large say 
Because of course, in the case, it's much, much bigger than delta. Okay. And then what I'm going to say is that a gamma and gamma are power of each other, namely, how so this one is going to be final. So it's going to be like this. So I draw the picture. So the projection is lost, so, so take point in P and Q in the projection such that the distance is large, very large. So you have P and Q here, and this distance is really large. And since this is a projection for my gamma, there must be a point P prime and Q prime which projects to this one. To, to indicate this is a projection, let me put this. Although it doesn't really make sense, but this is a projection for P prime to P. All down. Okay. And then you see this kind of picture before. So you have four points and you try to say something about it. Okay. So, well, I really don't argue uh, precisely, but uh, you, 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 you draw in this kind of uh, diagonal geodesic, and, and you know that those two geodesics, uh, sorry, those two triangles are the, the same. And the conclusion is that, uh, in fact, you can show that uh, this subsegment from P prime to Q prime on a, a gamma is going to look like this. Okay. This sort of rectangle shape is not wide, but it has to collapse like this. You, you, can, you can show this. Uh, for, I, I'm using that uh, this P is a projection on P prime. Remember, uh, it's not going to look like this. So the, the argument I used in here. So the claim is that uh, uh, so then exist R on S on a gamma such that P, P minus R is at most 10 delta and um, S minus Q is at most uh, 10 delta. So this is, uh, this is R and this is S and this is say 10 delta. Which you can show. Maybe you can you can get a better bound, but the result is enough for, for me. And also, this was the axis for a inverse G A, as I mentioned, and this is axis for G. So now I use the action of G and A G A inverse around here. So. Um, So the claim is, so as long as G and P is in this segment here, so, okay, remember gamma is the axis by G. So I'm assuming this distance between P and Q are very large, so you can apply G many times, maybe 100 times. So as long as n is that, that number, then um, Well, in fact, this could be plus, plus n. But what I'm saying is that, so now I apply, so I apply g to the n to p to get this point. But uh, this, this yellow line was well, well, a part of the axis for a g a inverse. So I start applying a g a inverse and try to pull this point back to here. 
So, so therefore, if it, okay. So, this point is mapped here by AGA inverse or AGA inverse inverse. So I apply it many sufficiently many times. Then, since the, the, you know those yellow line and white line are parallel to each other for for, for for this part, so you can you can map you can find uh, this point uh, near near P, which is if you, if you try to compute it, uh, it's 100 meters now. If you if you are not familiar with this argument, just imagine that this this white line and the other line exactly coincide. And, and you have two options, G and AGA inverse on the same line, and you, you, you push the line by G and you pull it back using the action by AGA inverse. So th this is what you get. But then uh, now I use the, 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 uh, the assumption that my action was proper. Therefore, um, if you have too many too many n, which which satisfy this inequality, something is wrong. To be precise, for different n and n prime, this element has to be same. So by properness, there must be only finitely many elements, which does this. Exist n1 and n2, which are different, such that uh, a, G, A inverse, and one, G, N, uh, and one is A, G, A inverse, uh, and two, G, N. The whole is clear. So there are only finitely many elements which that which satisfy this inequality. Now we apply pigeon hole argument. Therefore, for different n, n1 and n2, those two elements have to coincide. Now we just algebra. From this, you get a g n1 a inverse g n1 is a g n2 a inverse g n2. So you cancel this A, and you get G N1 minus N2, uh, A inverse, sorry, A inverse with A is G N1 N2. Uh, it's not right, no, this is N2 minus N2. Just a just a group theory. Uh, how this is okay. Yeah. So so now let's write this k. So a g k a inverse is g minus k. Okay. By the way, so gamma was axis for g. So so this axis. Oh, this is, is gamma, okay? So gamma was axis for G, therefore gamma is axis for G to the minus K. K is some um, positive number. And also, uh, you remember this is a conjugate of G to the K, so the axis of this element is uh, sorry, A gamma, right? Because gamma is axis for G to the K, therefore the conjugate as axis, which is a, a gamma, but actually they are same element, therefore those two, two geodesics, gamma and a gamma, is the, the, the two axes for the same element. Therefore, remember, if you have two axes for the same element, they are power. So a gamma is gamma, okay? So what did I show? The projection is too large, then they are power. So which uh, 
I, I guess so. Uh, do I have to? Uh, yeah, yes. Properness constant and also translation lens. Yeah. So, uh, so at the beginning, what you, uh, where do you start from? You start from P first. Which P? This uh, P. The large P. This P. Okay, good, good point. Um, you are right, certainly this argument depends on the properness constant. Okay? The properness constant depends on the point. Okay? However, as long as that point you know, is on the geodesic, sorry, or on the axis, properness constant is going to be uniform on that axis, right? Because uh, there is a co-compact action. Yeah. So maybe I'm using that. Well, in, in the baby case of hyperbolic surface, of course, the uh, properness constant is uniform because of the injectivity radius bound from the wall. But you are right, so, yeah, I, I, I'm, uh, I, I think I'm using many things. You are right that, that I have to take into account that the uh, properness constant and also translation length because of this fission hole argument. Okay. If, if this translation length is large, I have to take K very large so that I can do this sort of so you were right. Okay, so I stop here.